forgive me if I stumble a little bit, I actually thought this was some kind of elaborate prank until I saw both my parents uh, here, in, here in the audience. And uh, happily enough, I'm, I'm always prepared uh, to talk about my work. Um, when, I, when I asked Ed Canton of the Lemelson program, uh, Lemelson MIT program, what I should talk about, he said, talk about yourself. And I thought about that. I'm actually not so comfortable talking about myself. Uh, and so this is not going to be a talk about me. Um, but I am, however, very comfortable talking about uh, my ideas about our work, uh, the kind of work we've done. And what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is particularly about my thoughts on technological development, information and communications technologies especially, how that's changing. Uh, this is something that Rose and I, through our work in developing countries, Dr. Mark Rabowski as well, have managed to see firsthand the revolution of cell phones, et cetera, all the stuff that's happening. And I'd like to put it in some kind of a context to give you some idea of, of how I think about this. So rather than talk about me, I'd like to talk about this guy. Um, does anybody in the audience, I'm going to be shocked to death if anybody knows who this person is, who is probably one of the most significant figures in information and communication technology in human history. Anybody? What a, what a shame. I didn't actually know, know what he looked like until I looked him up on Wikipedia. Uh, this, is, this is Johannes Gutenberg. And Johannes Gutenberg, of course, unleashed an internet-like explosion of information technology, mass, mass communication technology. And I think there are, there are huge parallels between what happened back then and what's happening back now, what's happening now, and I'd like to talk to you about that. So in general, I think I'm going to call this the history and the prehistory of information and communication technologies, ICT, and the coming, what I think of as the coming innovation revolution, because I really do think that we are on the cusp of a tsunami of innovation with regards to this kind of technology. So act one, what I think of as an information and communication technology ICT in the days of few to few. When you had handwritten manuscripts were the method of information transmission for the most part and oral. So you had very few people who knew how to write, very few people who had the resources to be able to make their ideas, put their ideas on paper and be able to spread them around. And those ideas in general, when they shared them, of course, when you're transmitting them by handwritten manuscripts and there's no way to photocopy and there's no way to transmit digitally, you get a lot of transcri transcription errors. It's not a very high fidelity matter. It's very difficult to get your ideas spread around. And obviously, that was a revolution in its time, but highly limited. I think the next act to me is where Gutenberg comes in. And this is where uh, you still had a situation where with the printing press, pictured here, with the printing press, you still had very few people who could afford a printing press. John, John Peter Zenger once said, the freedom of the press belongs to those who own a press. And I think that is exactly as true today as it, as it was at the time that he said it. And I think uh, as I go through this, one of the things I really want people to, talk, to think about is who is able to produce information and who is able to consume information, both interesting questions that have changed because of the technologies that have been developed and the technologies that continue to be developed. So again, with the printing press, we changed from few being able to communicate through handwritten documents to others. In fact, uh, again, a revolution in the ability to produce high fidelity copies, except for perhaps an occasional transcription error uh, or a typo, and transmit your information from a very few people who had access to a printing press to many people around. And we all, I think, know and have read about in our history classes exactly what happened as a result of this. People have largely, they don't really think about the significance of this first mass communication technology, but the fact is this unleashed mass literacy. You know, before the printing press, you might have had, what, less than 1% of the European population were able to read. How could democracy have, flour have flourished in that kind of an environment? It, it could not, and it did not. What about a situation in which uh, you change from that to maybe 25 to 30 percent literacy after, you know, maybe 200 years after the printing press? That was a hugely significant change, ushered in the Age of Enlightenment, ushered in the Protestant Reformation, uh, along with uh, wars, border changes, et cetera, huge political changes, huge societal upheaval as a result simply of this technology and the ability of still a few people, just a few, to be able to communicate their ideas to many people at the same time. But of course, that had its day as well. And I think as we move forward, uh, I think we realize that now we've moved to a real golden age. People often refer to this as the information age. Now, I think the information age really started, as you can tell, way back when. But the information age is really hitting its stride with the development of the internet. Because of course, with the internet, it's not few people communicating with few other people. With the internet, we finally have the possibility for many people to be able to both produce and to consume 
information. And what that means is that rather than just having a couple people able to share their ideas with either a few people or with larger groups of people, now we can recognize that many, many people have great ideas that need to be shared. And without that technology, it simply wasn't happening before. I mean, think what, think what happens when only, you know, again, people who have access to the printing press. I, I remember reading one time, someone was describing uh, uh, equal rights for women and saying, you know, in countries where this is not implemented, it's like those countries are fighting an economic battle with one hand tied behind their back. Well, what happens when only, you know, 2% of the population in your country have access to communications methods? You know, I, I can't even think of what the, the anatomical analogy is for that. But it's certainly, you know, you're not going to win that fight. So again, with the internet, we finally have this really revolutionary method of allowing more people to participate both in the consumption and in the production of technology. But just to summarize the, the, the points that I've made so far, I think the printing press, the key thing was increasing the number of consumers of information. I think the internet, we're talking about increasing the producers of information. We've seen this with, uh, certainly since Web 2.0, Facebook, MySpace, Blogger, all these people who did not have a voice that could reach literally billions of people are now able to do so. This is, this is a vast change, and I think we are only, actually, I don't think we're only beginning to understand the changes that this is going to bring about. I think we haven't got the slightest idea about the changes that this is going to bring about. But I did say that I thought the innovation revolution was coming, that it wasn't here, and so if I'm not talking about the internet, then the question becomes, what am I talking about? Because we already have, as I said, many-to-many -many production consuming of information, and we see what that's, what that's doing to our lives all around us for, for good and for, and for bad. W what could I be thinking about? We, we already have many to many. Where could it go from there? And I think there we have to recognize that the many to many we're talking about are many in a very, very few areas of the world. So we think about the internet. We think of everybody's on the web. We think everybody's on Facebook, right? And increasingly that's so. But we have to recognize that the everybody we've been talking about for about the last 10 years is a tiny fraction of the world's population. And again, getting back to that analogy of trying to fight with one hand tied behind your back, what are we doing when we say that the majority, literally the majority of the world's population, have no voice? Right? I go online, I can rate music, I can rate blog entries, I can add my comments, I can say what I want to say, give my opinions, as I freely do, about so many things in so many different ways, and most people in the world do not have that ability. Or until recently, there was not even the possibility of their having that ability. However, I think there is hope, and the hope comes in the form of this graph. And so uh, don't make me call on you. Does anybody have the slightest idea what this graph might be? Of course, it could be many things. I know Mark Grabowski does, but I'm not going to answer him. Yes, you in the, on the side. Uh, no, it's not people communicating on the internet. That's close. Now, just like that TV show whose name escapes me, if you need to call a friend at home to get the answer, that's okay. <laughs> Hint. This is the percentage of the people in the world, worldwide, who are using mobile phones. And, and the, the, the far right side of that graph is just peaking over 50% right now. Now, of course, that's a sobering statistic in itself because we do think that everybody has a mobile phone and everybody has access to the internet. And it really is only going over 50% at this point. But think about that. I mean, 10 years ago, we couldn't, have a, we couldn't have had a conversation about getting information out to people directly at all. It simply was physically impossible. The infrastructure wasn't there. Now the infrastructure is there. This platform for communication is increasingly there. And while we're only up to 50% worldwide, in certain groups that are particularly important to me as a physician and epidemiologist, like health workers in developing countries, I can tell you there is not a health worker in sub-Saharan Africa who doesn't have a mobile phone. Not, not one. Not one. And so while, of course, we'll be able to do even more things when the entire population has it, there's all sorts of things that we could be doing right now. I'm happy to say that EpiSurveyor is an example of one thing we're doing to take advantage of that platform. But there's also many more things that we're not doing, and I think we, we ought to, mostly because we don't think of mobile phones. We don't think of this as a computer platform. We think of it as a way to make voice calls, because that's what we mostly do with it. So again, when, we, when I say many to many is not the end of it, and this mobile phone revolution, what is it going to, what is it going to bring to us? Again, I think of this analogy of fighting the battle with your hand.